specialists and non-specialists. And in fact, as I'll try to argue, the work that we've been doing over the years uh, in intercultural communication has led us to the position of realizing that communication between specialists and non-specialists is really pretty much the same linguistic ball game as communication between people from two different countries. We speak different languages, we have different reasons for speaking, we have different things we want to say. And it's often the case that a specialist uh, in, say, uh, Germany, a medical specialist, could speak to a specialist in China in the same field more easily than talking to non-specialists within their own language in their own country. And so uh, it's this, uh, in, in this spirit that I'm trying to take this up that uh, Guy Cook has introduced, that something that we can do from the field uh, that we specialize in is to uh, assist in some of these public uh, discourses and debates where people are really seeing things from different points of view and assist in pointing out how communication across these boundaries of specialisms uh, may be valuable to all of us. Uh, <clears throat> it's often phrased as intercultural or cross-cultural communication and the particular label doesn't matter much to me. But we found over the years of our work that often uh, what's phrased as cultural, a cultural problem or a cultural issue uh, may or may not be a cultural issue. I was asked to go to the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise, Idaho, uh, to work uh, in a training program for a while with uh, people involved in uh, uh, wildfire training. Uh, the problem, as it was uh, perceived, was that there was a cross-cultural communication problem between the fire crews, most of which are Native Americans, and the uh, various crew bosses, which are mostly educated in forestry, mostly non-Native Americans. Uh, why are they Native Americans? Because most of the uh, forests uh, are actually near or on uh, Indian reservations throughout the country, and it just happens by accident that those are the people in the vicinity. Um, and so it was phrased as a cultural problem, but as we got into this question, uh, it wasn't at all clear that the problem was a problem of culture as such or of communication as such. I'd remembered my uh, anthropology teacher, Hank Lewis, who worked in uh, the uh, issues of fire ecology uh, in the Philippines and in various other places. Um, and to make a long story short, uh, one of the major problems that was happening is the uh, bosses were saying, well, we've got to put this fire out, and the Native American fire crews were letting it burn because it made more sense to let that fire burn for the long-term sustainability of the forest. They were practicing ancient fire ecology, which the Forest Service hadn't quite caught up to yet. Now the Forest Service is doing more of uh, this kind of fire ecology, small low burns to save the big burns. But the fire crews knew that. It wasn't a communication problem, ex except in the sense that the university-educated crew bosses did not have the knowledge they needed to understand that the Native American crews knew what to do. Okay, so uh, we got into that situation and realized that, that it wasn't really such a, a problem of language so much as a, a difference of specialization, difference of knowledge, and a recognition that the people on the other side did know something uh, that needed to be acknowledged. Uh, in another uh, case altogether, again, I was asked to work for Nokia mobile phones when they were first uh, entering the Chinese market. Um, and uh, we did a training program uh, that was conducted throughout the world in Finland, in uh, Asia, and uh, in uh, Great Britain. Uh, and their main concern was introducing uh, cell phones into uh, China. Now, uh, if you know anything about Finland or Scandinavia, I think uh, you'll have in mind that it's a fairly quiet place in many ways. Uh, one of the ways this shows up, uh, I've shown here in the picture, um, at the University of Uvascula, all of the faculty have these little stoplights on their doors. So if there's a red on there, you don't even knock. You don't make noise at all. You just leave them alone. Uh, you know, and if there's a yellow, well, um, you know, if you're the right kind of person, you might be able to disturb them. And only if it's green would you go so far if you were a student or something, is to knock on that door and disturb somebody. Okay, so we've got a culture, a group of people who um, are very quiet. I've heard people in Finland speaking on the cell phone sitting right next to me, and I couldn't hear a word they were saying. Right. Uh, okay, so that's uh, where we're coming from, and uh, they're trying to introduce telephones into a place that, if you've ever been to Hong Kong, is a very, very noisy place. And the problem came, it was very simple. They had to engineer the ringers to be louder 
It was, a simple, it was just a straight engineering job. The phones weren't ringing loud enough for people to hear them when they rang. All they did was just crank that up a little bit louder, and people bought them, and now they're the number one seller of phones over there. Now, it didn't have anything to do with culture so much. It did a little bit with volume at which people talk, but it had to do with the density of crowding in public places and the traffic and the noises. And sitting in Finland, an engineer never imagined that they needed a phone that would make that much noise. So they just didn't engineer it. All they had to do was make it louder and it worked fine. So Here. Uh, this is kind of how we look at it, that there are many different kinds of things happening in a particular situation. You have the system, the world system of food production and distribution circulating through that moment of these people having dinner together. You have individual personal histories with different kinds of uh, food preferences, conversational topics. You have food allergies, food intolerances in some of the people present. Uh, and you may have various kinds of interaction-based social perceptions, and I'll look at that uh, in a
I noticed was this one guy was slightly different from the others in his posture, in his gesture, in his movement, and the cut of the clothes that he had. He was not identical. The other guys were identical. You could just switch them around. Okay, well, that's that's the sort of national culture's view that we sort of see that one standing out because he's a little bit different from the others, and then if something happens, we see that as having to do with that natural culture thing. And we're starting to read the nonverbal cues. Now, a lot of this came out of that, uh, that domain of study. It's very important work because it's very interesting and taught us a lot about how people communicate. We learned a lot of things about proxemics and body language, how people relate to each other, how you can read, how people look when they are in relationship to each other. It taught us a lot about uses of space. Uh, I mentioned the, uh, the Finnish stoplight on the academic doors. The one in the upper left corner of Denmark, a university, that's an a person's office, uh, not very welcoming as far as at least I see. The one on the right is an American <laughs> University office where two emeritus professors sit in there, the door wide open, anybody can just walk in and start saying hello to them. Uh, this is the sort of thing that Hall and others noticed, that there's really big differences in whether people make themselves available or not in the use of spaces. But these are important and interesting things. And uh, th this body of research and this way of looking at intercultural communication had very definite institutional outcomes. The Foreign Service Institute was established principally to develop these kinds of concepts. Many of our students at Georgetown work there. Um, and so uh, from this point of view, communication is basically strategic. First of all, in national interest, and second, as it's developed in business interest, which is sometimes uh, uh, the same as national interest. Um, but this point of view has um, other things to consider. This comes out of Harper's Magazine, an article called Semper Sensitive. It was a handout that accompanied a week-long course on Iraq's customs and history given to U.S. Marines as part of their training. The course advised by the Marine Corps Division Schools was introduced last September. Uh, this would uh, be in uh, 03. Uh, with the intention of improving relations between Iraqis and U.S. forces. Um, some of the things it says, this is a selection, do not shame or humiliate a man in public. Shaming a man will cause him and his family to be anti-coalition. Most important qualifier for all shame is a third party to witness the act. You must do something likely to cause shame or move the person from the view of others. Shame is given by placing wood over a detainee's head. Avoid this practice. Placing a detainee on the ground or putting a foot on him implies you are God. This is one of the worst things we can do. Um, this was training so that people would not do these things. Uh, I don't need to tell probably anybody in this room that people did do these things. Uh, I can't tell you why they did those things, and I don't want to get into that. But what I'm saying is that it's training, cultural training within this model that stereotypes what people are like may intend to be used for good, it can be used for exactly the opposite reasons. And it has been in a variety of cases. And so this is a bit of a problem with this sort of stereotypical national strategic model of um, intercultural communication. In the 70s and through the 90s, um, a different view of uh, communication was developing, which we call social interactional view. Uh, the argument is that culture is not a static thing or a characteristic of a person, but something that arises through the thing each other in social interaction. More important, culture is an actually it's an interpretation of what people do rather than the cause of what people do. Uh, Sapir said many years ago, uh, when his colleague, his Chinese colleague, comes for uh, a Sunday dinner and they watch the kids playing, he sees. His kid's son, John, play, and he says, isn't it interesting how Chinese boys play? He sees his own son, David, play, and he says, you know, David has quite an interesting personality. Okay, the other is seen as cultural. The one one knows very well, one sees as And this is often the case, that we interpret a behavior in some way, and if it's at some distance from us, we interpret that as cultural behavior, rather than some other explanation. Well, John Gumperts and others introduced the notion of conversational inference to talk about how this process works in conversation. <clears throat> um, there's two key points. One is the inference works forward and the other is it works backwards. When um, speaker one begins to take a turn, uh, when I say the first thing in an interaction, 
I'm working with certain assumptions about what... ...today, uh, that our relationship is established well enough, I can agree with it. It implies many things. And by saying that, I'm saying, okay, this is how I understand the situation right now. And by saying this, I'm asking you to then verify if that's what's going on. So the speaker too then says something which does two things. It simultaneously refers back to say yes, what you just said is legitimate, and yes, our relationship is good, and yes, we can talk to each other. And they say that by saying I'm fine. How are you? Okay. And it, each the point is that as you go through conversation, at each point, one speaker says something which simultaneously projects an intention and ratifies a previous thing said. And this is what John Humphreys called conversational inference. And it's very important to the way we look at communication now. Um, two things about this. One is that uh, these inferences are made at a relatively quick speed so that there's never enough information to be sure. You never really know what somebody has just meant or intended. You have to work with some assumptions. <clears throat> and we have to do this in order to keep moving. You can't really stop if somebody says, how are you? You can't stop and reflect for 10, 10 or 15 minutes to figure out how you are before you answer. Uh, you, you've obviously said some, something very different if you do that. You know, uh, let's say, is this something? actually in Washington, D.C., uh, my wife, who doesn't fit in uh, very well there, she's from Hawaii, uh, was walking along the street, and she smiled at a woman and, and said, good morning. The woman said, are you OK? <laughs> so. Uh, you know, you don't do that in Washington. You don't smile and say hello to somebody. You leave them alone, you know. And if you do interrupt their lives with saying good morning, they want to know, are you all right? You know, should I call the police or should I call an ambulance or a psychiatrist or something? Uh, now, what happens when people speak and make these assumptions is they take into consideration virtually everything that they can tell by looking at you. They, they can tell your age to, to a certain extent, how you're dressed, the time of day, and all of these things. They draw a whole set of inferences based on this kind of information that's coming from. These inferences can be right or wrong, but they draw those inferences in order to be able to move along. These things happen very fast. Um, I was in an airport, this was some years ago, but it's just like what you have here um, in, uh, in Des Moines, where the uh, bags come out on a, on a baggage carrier and they go through those uh, you know, sort of plastic straps that hang down. And we were all, it was a, a long flight, and everybody on the flight was very tired. We were waiting for our bags to come, and we were standing there sort of just not paying any attention to anybody around us. And just the woman was standing right next to me. She was older than I was by a number of years. And she started just behaving in a strange way. I'll stand over here so you can see, and you should be able to hear. This is what she was doing. Hello, super honey. <laughs> and she was kind of wiggling and baby talking and so forth. She was standing right there next to me. And so, you know, I had gone from standing there being quite happy to wait for my bag to seeing this woman being rather disturbed. So I looked to see what was happening. I saw her line of sight, and she was looking over there, and coming out from the straps down there was... <laughs> now you can see why she was doing that. She had her pet dog in the thing. She was talking to her dog. I know how people talk to pet dogs. I've heard it lots. I've done a bit of it myself. I saw that. I can understand that behavior. Made all the sense in the world. I ignored her again and went back to just waiting for my own bag. The thing is, this whole thing happened in a period of about a second and a half. Okay, It went from assuming everything was fine, not paying attention, to wondering what was going on, to getting a solution, and saying it's fine. Now, I never checked what was inside that box. Now, and if it had been a box of pineapples or something, then I would have had to go back. This woman really was crazy. But the point is, I made the inference very quickly on the basis of what I knew and assumed, and it was enough to forget about it for them, from then on. And that's what we do sort of every second or so as we move through every social interaction we have. We make an assumption. If it works, we go to the next one. If it works, we go to the next one and keep going. We don't have time to stop and check. Uh, this produces um, what we've called the conversational pendulum. And what this is, it turns just exchange. They go back and forth. I say something, somebody else, I say it again, back and forth. Now what's interesting about this is the speed at which these turns change. 
Because if everything, if the two people agree on the, uh, the speed of the turn exchange, everything is fine. I take my turn, I pause, it's your turn, you take your turn. You pause, I take my turn. But if two people don't agree on that, then you run into a problem. If I move a little bit faster than you do, um, I'll say what I have to say, I'll wait for you to take your turn. You haven't said anything, so I'll speak again. And then I'll wait, you haven't said anything, so I'll speak again. And again, and again, and again. And it happens after a while that you begin to feel that I'm kind of arrogant, I'm kind of pushy, and I'm not paying any attention to you, and I'm not a very nice person when it comes down to it. And that can happen just with a slight difference in the sense of how long is an appropriate length of time to pause. Now, almost everybody has this experience at one point or another. Uh, I first uh, learned about this in dealing with my wife. My wife uh, is from Hawaii. People in Hawaii tend to move a bit slower in a lot of conversations. And I found frequently when I would say something, I'd ask her a question or say something, I began to realize just as I was speaking, she'd be going, <laughs> her mouth would just sort of, you know, I said, are you going to say something? Uh, no. You know, and then i go on. And, you know, why do you keep doing this? You know, if you just slow down a minute, you know, just let me say something, you know. And so you begin to realize that um, if one person is moving slightly faster than the other, you are really cutting off any opportunity of them getting involved in the conversation. Um, that's the first stage, and the other part of it is that as soon as you do that, you begin to make assumptions about what's going on with that other person and why they're doing it. Uh, some work that was done by Siegmund and Feldstein a number of years ago, um, they found that in, they paired people, and this is really quite thorough work because uh, they paired women who were quite similar to each other in ethnicity and age and uh, region of the country. And they paired them in all possible pairings of these women multiple times. So every woman spoke to the other woman at different, over different times. Uh, and in every case, the, um, what should I say, there was no woman who was universally faster or universally slower. And in some situations, one person would be slower than the same person at a different time. I'm saying that right. But what they found was the person who was faster always judged herself to be warmer, friendlier, open-minded, and concerned about other people. And the person who was slower judged herself as being colder, hostile, not feeling very well, not being open to listen, and so forth. And so they found that these attributions of personality characteristics were being given to people on the basis of whether they were faster or slower in that social interaction. Uh, that's an important piece of research for us because <clears throat> if that happens between me and you one time and the next time it goes the other way because I feel different that day and so forth, there's no problem. We don't draw permanent conclusions about each other. But if there's anything that makes it happen quite regularly, so there's some characteristic that you have that's similar to some characteristic some other person has, that I have the same experience with both of you, that I put you in the same group. You're people who are like that. You know, you're fast talkers, or you're slow talkers, and I don't like one group or the other. You begin to create these sort of group stereotypes, group attributions to people of members of group if you see the similarity in behavior. Now the problem is, what you can't do about this is change your own behavior very easily. It's very difficult for people to learn to moderate their own tempo. People can learn to do it. Actors do this, and people with intensive training do it. But it's quite difficult to do sort of on the spot. Say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slow down a little bit. I, we had a teacher in a teacher training program that we told about this. And he brought a video back uh, for the next session. He said, um, I tried, but uh, I don't know. It didn't seem to work. And let's look at the video. So we put on the video. And he was talking to his class. And, uh, he said, now, here's a perfect example. So I really tried to slow down and let him talk. So, so does anybody here? have another question? Well, if not, we'll go on to the next one. <laughs> so uh, it's very difficult to do this right. You have to do it at the right time and in the right place and in a way that the other person will ratify. That's difficult. It's also difficult to consciously inhibit drawing conclusions about other people that arise in these kinds of social interactions. You just you start feeling it. It's very difficult to, to control that. It's also uh, difficult to say, okay, it doesn't matter, even though I am speaking from, to a person from New York, and even though they are rattling me with their questions, they won't shut up, I know that they mean to be sincere and show involvement, and so I'll still like them, even though I feel like this is irritating me. This is very hard to do. 
Okay, and uh, so we don't recommend that. What we did was start a different line of research, and that's what's led to the questions of today. <laughs> Using our own work and many other people's work, <clears throat> I'm going to list just 15. There are many more factors, but just 15 factors here that will change the rate of <clears throat> speaking between two people. <clears throat> and the list is here, and I'll go through them in, in just a bit of detail. Um, and I'll come at the end of this list to the question of food, drink, and medications, and personality, and cultural and social practices. What I'm trying to signal right here at this moment is that out of all of these factors, personality differences and cultural differences are just two of 15. Okay? They're not the whole story. They're just a small piece of the story, and there's a lot of other things. And that food that you eat or drink or various medications are every bit as important as culture or personality or eye level or territory in making these differences. And so I think we need to look at all of these. Uh, two people who are on the same eye level tend to equalize their rate of speech. They tend to change equally. A person with a higher uh, eye level takes control and speaks faster. A person with a lower one speaks slower. An angular position tends to equalize people. If you're face, face to face with each other, you polarize. If you're slower for any reason, you go slower and slower, and the others faster, they go faster and faster through face to face. If you're angular, particularly against something else, you tend to equalize. Um, this is research that I, I'm just summarizing very quickly for you. Uh, a neutral territory tends to equalize. If you're in my territory, I gain control. I talk faster, you talk slower. If we're in your territory, you gain control. This is my old boss at Ford Motor Company, Dearborn Engine Plant in Detroit. <laughs> he was a funny guy. He had a he had a brother named Tony. He said, you know, Tony's the kind of guy that when he's talking loud and laughing a lot, he thinks everybody's having a good time. <laughs> and in a sense, that says exactly what I'm trying to tell you. That we're projecting our own assumptions about what's going on into a situation that aren't really there and shared by the other people in that situation. But we're projecting them in there and saying, this is what's going on. Power disparity. The most powerful person sets the tempo, and the less, lesser powerful person needs to match that tempo in some way. Okay. Um, age disparity. If people are pretty much about the same age and, and generation, uh, and this is, I think, pretty mammalian. I mean, we're talking about sort of physical capacity and so forth. They tend to equalize. The older one tends to become the pacemaker, and the younger one tends to adapt to the older pacemaker. You can see this. We've observed it in gorillas at the zoo, and we've seen it in dogs and cats. I watch every day. I go through a park where we've got old dogs and little small dogs playing. And the old dogs move slower and so forth, and young dogs come yipping around, and the old dogs just take a little bite, and they slow down and go on. Uh, physical size is a very important thing. Bigger tends to be slower, uh, but the bigger is the pacemaker. Okay, and this we've observed at the San Diego Zoo with gorillas. The condition of your health. Um, some days you're slower than other days. It's simple as that. You have a bad cold, you're on medication, you're not moving as fast. <clears throat> your mood, uh, a lot of people, how many times have you said, I'm just in a bad mood, uh, and you are. You just aren't ready to talk very much or very quickly. Crowding, number of participants in an event. Um, now, not like this necessarily, but any, uh, active participants, like a meeting or something, uh, tends to increase the tempo of the faster participants and decrease the tempo of the slower particip participants. So you get more polarization. You've all noticed in meetings, there's one or two people end up doing all the talking. Gender difference. Um, there is, there are some differences, but there is no difference associated with men or with women. It's when the two people speaking to each other perceive themselves to be in different gender categories, then it tends to polarize. Whichever member is faster goes faster than they did, and whichever is slower goes slower than they did. So there's something about this, this, this gender polarization. Mediating technologies such as uh, satellite uh, links that cause delays and so forth, and produce exactly the same effects. I talked to John Guppert on the telephone by satellite delay from, uh, from Alaska, and he said, you know, you really sounded like you were angry with me. And I said, John, this is stuff you've been writing about for the last 10 years, you know, it's just the satellite did that, you know, it just delayed my response, and it cut you off, you know, it was technology, it wasn't me. But you attribute the same kinds of things to people. Thought, take some time to think, and it's going to slow down how quickly you can respond. 
come to something that is very important to me now. Um, such things as sedatives or uh, stimulants <coughs> uh, produce changes in these temples as well. Um, if you uh, are going to New York and you're not a particularly quick speaker, I advise you to get on coffee, you know, six, eight cups, and uh, <laughs> you, you might stand a chance. There might be a way into that. But I was on the train just, uh, just two weeks ago, and I was standing, I thought, right at the counter to buy a cup of coffee because I felt I was going to have to up to everybody's feet. A guy came right in front of me, bought his coffee, and walked away <laughs> you know, before I could even place my order. And I don't know how he perceived that space that would be a big enough space for somebody to get in and make an order. But he just walked in, didn't apologize, and just you know, made his own, gone, there he was. So, um, but it's a difference. And I'm not trying to say New York is a bad people. Um, it's just that that's how it's done. And it's very hard for me to kind of gear myself into that. Personality. Uh, some people just have sort of quick moving personalities, or have slow moving personalities. There's no two ways about it. Uh, various cultural and social practices. This is uh, one of my favorite New Yorkers, Deborah Tannen. We've been arguing about this for years and years and years. Um, and I've been saying, well, you know, when people are slower, it's not because they just don't love you, you know, it's just that they, they're a little different, you know. And she said, well, you know, just because people are asking a lot of questions, you know, shot machine gun questions and so forth, doesn't mean they don't want to be involved with you. That's exactly what they're trying to do. And uh, I agree with her entirely, but within that particular group, you can interpret it that way. If you're not part of that group, then you give it a different interpretation. So if we take all of these factors, uh, we can see there are many, many factors that will make a difference in whether somebody speaks faster or slower. And there's many other things besides speed that I could look at, I just don't have time. There's many factors. And questions of culture, personality, are just some of those. And food is just some of those. Okay, so I'm not going to try to make too big an issue of food when I talk about that, and I'm not going to make too, too, I want to make a much smaller issue of culture than we usually do. It's there, but it's not the whole story. It's just one piece of this whole thing. Um, and so what we get, uh, unfortunately, is when these things happen, this very narrow range of attributions. People tend to explain what went on as being something cultural or something about personality. It's either something about the person's nature or character or something about the culture that they're a member of. And this is what I'm trying to get around and what we've been working against for a number of years. There's many factors that can lead us to draw conclusions about other people. Okay, so what you can do is not focus on cultural interpretations or even personality ones. What you can do is change as many of these factors as you can possibly change. If you perceive yourself as dealing with somebody that doesn't seem to warm up to you, that seems a bit withdrawn, seems a little bit hostile, and doesn't, then I would say start with the assumption that you're talking too fast. And then apply some of these things. Slow yourself down. Put yourself on sedatives. Put them on coffee. Make sure that they're sitting higher than you are. Sit yourself down lower. Go to their territory to talk to them rather than making them come to your territory. Don't confront them face to face. Don't sit them across the table to talk to them. Sit together and talk about something else. Manipulate all of these things, and you can greatly improve the amount of communication that you're able to uh, manage with other people. Now, where does food come into this? To me, food is an extremely important, and what's important, it's a controllable variable in this. This is something that's very difficult to control people's uh, uh, personalities, their life histories, their ideas about culture. If you can control the food you eat. And so this is something I think that comes very much within the domain of what we can look at. People say you are what you eat frequently enough. I'd like to say you are what people say you are because of what you eat. Okay? If I eat foods that kind of pump me up, make me talk faster, people are going to start saying, oh, he's from the East Coast. That's the way they are there. Okay? They're not going to say, yeah, he just had a big meal of corn. Okay? Because I'm allergic to corn. That's one of the things corn does. It gives me this kind of hyper-reactive... Uh, style for a while. And it dies off, and I feel kind of sick after that. Okay. Uh, but the, the thing is, that reaction that people might have is a reaction to food I've ingested. It's not sort of inherent in my, uh, my personality, my way of being. And so, to some extent, in this particular case, I'd say people, you are what people say you are, partly because of what you eat. Um, and so we've taken this different view of communication between people, including intercultural communication, uh, to start looking at the resources people use when they come to communicating with people and how they can exploit or, or uh, use those resources 
to alter uh, the interactions and therefore alter their perceptions of other people. Uh, we uh, put together a handbook on this some years ago called Responsive Communication. Just Google the words Responsive Communication. It's the first thing that comes up. It's on the net and you can look at it. And that's, uh, that's where we've talked about this in a great deal of detail. <coughs> Commercial break we're on here. Uh, Nexus Analysis is a book. It's over on the table there. It's our newest book. And um, this is a place in which we try to outline this very broad procedure and a very broad ethnographic approach uh, to these kinds of ideas. Now I want to come to the question specifically of corn and intercultural communication, particularly the question of world commodity. Um, I won't be able to go into this in the detail it deserves, but that's probably all right because much of what I'd like to say, I don't have the authority or the knowledge to say yet. It's a very new field, and my main goal here, if you get even this point at all, is I wish there were more research in this area, much more research, and I think linguists should be involved in this. Uh, anybody who has an interest in language should be involved, because I think it will affect all of us. So I'm really here just to say, here's something I'd like this to be involved in. It's the relationship between social interaction and foods. I have an allergy, as I've mentioned, to corn and quite a few other things. Um, among the things that uh, are listed as corn uh, uh, responses are fuzzy thinking, joint pains, hyperactivity, and this is a crucial one for this talk business, uh, inability to concentrate, lethargy, and other things of that sort. Now, if we have a meal like this, a group of friends, and we eat some corn together, now, people may say it was because I had too much wine or beer. They're not likely to say he had too much corn. Okay? So the point is we learn to understand this for certain food substances. We know that wine makes people confused and talk fuzzy. We don't know that corn does that, but it does. Uh, by the way, there's, in most American wines, there's corn. So uh, we're not sure which it is causing this issue. But the point is people are quite ready to make attributions of personality characteristics or modification because of some substances, and I'm saying food substances are among these. Uh, the solution that's generally given is simply avoid corn. Well, you've got this problem, avoid corn. Uh, that's a nice idea. What is corn and where is it? Well, it's everywhere, uh, and, and your university is determined to make that true. Um, why is it everywhere and how is it everywhere? And this is where we come to the question uh, that I'll have to finish with when I get there in a few minutes uh, of intellectual property. Uh, corn's in our diet. This is, uh, this is corn in China. So uh, if you go to China, you can get a deer of corn right there on the street. Uh, you'll be able to have your corn. And it's pretty good, too. It won't be served quite the way you probably want it, but it's there. Uh, but it's in such things as you know popcorn and so forth. Uh, it's in our uh, cooking oils, many of them named as corn oil, many of them not. Uh, in places like corn flakes, uh, Cheerios. Uh, Cheerios people think is being about oats, but look on the label someday and you realize there's almost as much corn in Cheerios as there is oats. Um, Coca-Cola is about as much corn as any other ingredient except for water. Um, Prosopy, most of the infant formulas are about 60% corn. Okay, so any children growing up on formula are being fed from, from when they first started a pure corn diet. This is good for business, so uh, if you've got babies feeding corn. Uh, bakery products, beer and wine in the United States, most beers and wines, unless they're made by German purity laws, have corn in them. Ketchup and condiments you probably know about. Coffee creamer, that's just about all corn. Uh, most oriental foods that you get in the United States have corn in as corn syrup, uh, some thickener. Ice creams mostly have corn in Sausage, lunch meats. National Corn Growers Association website is where you get some information. Here's a list. I don't intend you to read these details, but it's just about every food you can think of. That is the rest of the list. I couldn't get it onto one screen. But it's not just there. If I want to brush my teeth, this product is more corn than any other ingredient. It's called sorbitol. If I want to gargle, that's corn. Okay, uh, let's say I want to write about this. Okay, uh, the paper, uh, all these reams of paper are laced with corn powder to make sure they feed through your printer and your Xerox machine better. Uh, you lick your uh, envelopes, that's corn. Um, the, the glue and the stamps, that's corn. Uh, tape, you tape up the package, you know, that's corn. Uh, maybe this all gives you a headache or stomachache because this is one of the uh, uh, symptoms that you get. 
Unfortunately, the base that's used for most headache remedies is corn. It's a uh, cornstarch. It's one of the most versatile uh, products because it can be used as a carrier for almost anything else. If you want to take health food uh, supplements and so forth, mostly corn-based health food supplements. Corn Growers Association estimates some 3,500 <coughs> products. These are not food products. Uh, made of corn uh, that are widely used in the United States. Uh, corn is really everywhere. So what is it? <clears throat> well, this is the problem. If you are allergic to corn, trying to find it is another problem. You have to avoid it, but where is it and what is it called? Dextrose, glucose, dextrin, maltodextrin, lecithin, fructose, high fructose, vegetable starch, thickeners, sweeteners, syrup, vegetable oil, maize, sorbitol, and many, many other names, sometimes proprietary names that are owned and sometimes product description names. <clears throat> and so unless you have a rather um, elaborate notion of the linguistics of what corn is called in its various uh, forms, it's very difficult to find in the board. Um, ADM is a world leader in corn sweeteners, dextrose, crystal, and fructose, maltodextrin, cocoa powder, citric, elastic, lactic acid. But we also bring you surprising ways to add value to almost any beverage you make. You'll find a natural source vitamin E that's truly clear Soy protein is certified organic, plus an innovative way to add soluble dietary fiber with no discernible change to your beverage's flavor, color, or texture. Okay, so you can't see it, you can't taste it, you know, it's there. And there's an industry that has, I think, a, a major uh, uh, reason to put corn into everything. Uh, it's almost impossible to find foods without corn in any of these uh, kinds of businesses. You go to Europe, you so far can find food that isn't full of corn, uh, but the U.S. Uh, sued the European Union for 1.8 billion in losses caused by a ban on genetically modified products, which eliminated most of the importation of corn, at least for until that suit is settled. Why is it everywhere? Well, it started with uh, Castro and the boycott of Cuban sugar. We used to eat mostly sugar in this country. This was good for Iowa, believe me, because you didn't grow very much corn, I mean sugar here, and some beet sugar, but um, corn uh, became the major substitute, and a huge uh, industry has developed to increase the uh, use of corn products. 19 billion annual value right now is the value of corn production in the United States. 4.5 billion is our export value, and that's the biggest agricultural export the United States uh, makes. So this is extremely important uh, here. Uh, and now, believe it or not, Cuba is the 14th largest foreign market for Iowa corn. So not only are we not getting Cuban sugar, now we're selling our corn to Cuba. Uh, how is it everywhere? And this is what I want to come to. The legal muscle is intellectual property. When Milton wrote Aeropagitica, it was an argument for uh, freedom of speech, for the protection of the work of authors such as himself. Um, within 66 years was the establishment of the Statute of Anne in 1710, which is the world's first copyright law. It says, among other things, um, to avoid these detrimental practices uh, and for the encouragement of learned men to compose and write useful books. This law was established. So the primary intent of, of the copyright law was so that learned men, uh, they of course didn't care about women writing books then, um, to compose and write useful books. Constitution of the United States uh, comes along, Article 1, Section 8, among the powers of Congress, uh, promote the progress of science, useful arts, securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So we've come from high culture, the protection of the literary works of learned men, to the protection of inventors and uh, their discoveries uh, in just about 66 years. So altogether it was about 120 years from the first copyright to when it was altered to the copyright of technology as opposed to literary works. And so this is why I'm saying that we came from a notion of culture to a notion of technology, which includes agriculture. Notice in the Constitution, this, uh, this part of the Constitution rates above declaring war, raising armies, migration, taxation, appropriations. It's right up there at the very beginning of the Constitution. It's one of the most important parts of this country. So this is how we get from culture to at least agricultural technology. 
Um, and I think there is a real uh, interesting um, intercultural uh, divide between the two notions of culture. Just a few words on intellectual property. Um, there's basically three schools, mostly they talk about two. One is the French one, and the emphasis is on the integrity of works of art. Uh, the Anglo-American, which is uh, in the US Constitution, focuses on the creation of wealth, both for individuals and for the nation. Now, I want to mention the Chinese notion of intellectual property because um, there's a book by Alfred called To Steal a Book is an Elegant Offense. And uh, it's a quotation of an old Chinese saying. Um, the Chinese, uh, it, it, they precluded any strategic information from getting outside of the court. And for strategic information, information, they included such things as calendars and almanacs. And any kind of information that was valuable that would make a difference in the success.